All righty. And for those of y'all who've taken four classes with me before, the syllabus talk is going to be kind of boring, but I'll try to make it short. <clears throat> And I always tend to say this, but whenever you click on a PDF or a PowerPoint or a Word doc inside D2L, go ahead and download it because the little preview thing is, is not, not so good. What do I mean by that? If you uh, preview something that has been saved as an RTF file, it may be missing entire sections. And if it's a multi-page file, you know, like a PowerPoint or a long PDF, it just isn't very good. All right, so my name, Jeff Thompson. Professor Thompson, Jeff, I don't care what you call me as long as it's not a bad word. My office is right downstairs. See hours posted in D2L or my door. I forgot to post the hours. I'll do that just, uh, just in a minute. But in general, I'm here Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. If you need me to come in on Thursday or Friday, then uh, text me and we'll, uh, we'll set something up. Speaking of texting me, even if I have your phone number from a prior class, please do this. Everybody, if you're willing to, please grab your phone and send me a text message. And I'll explain why you're doing this while, uh, while you do it. Okay, why? Because if you get stuck programming, you can text me day or night. Just take a picture of your screen. S send me a question saying I'm getting this error. And I may be able to help you right away. And the folks who take advantage of me in that fashion, take advantage of the opportunity, you're not taking advantage of me, right, because I'm, uh, I'm offering it, tend to do well or better in the classes than those who don't. Never be shy about it. I'm up till like 3 o'clock every morning, or I mean, you know, 3 a.m. every night. So you're not going to wake me up. And if you do, I do know how to s silence my phone. I finally figured that out. So please go ahead and text me your name so I know who you are. And I'll never contact you for anything outside of school purposes. What are the other things I might need to text you about? Well, if I know a tornado's coming in, or har har har, I'm kidding. Well, hopefully that won't happen. But if class has to be canceled, or I'm going to be late, or something you know very important class oriented is going to happen, I will text you and let you know. I'll also post about it, right? But everybody has their phones in on them, and we're not out of the bad weather season yet. But I hope nothing. Hope we don't have to cancel any classes. All right. So email, there's my email address, but if you text me, it's the fastest way. I don't always have my phone on me, but I always have my iPad on me, so texting is actually better than phone calls in that regard. If you send me email or you left me voicemail and you really wish that I would respond to it instantly, as instantly as possible, right? Send me a text saying, hey, I left your voicemail. Then I'll uh, go and track down my phone. All right, so what are we doing? Is this fundamentals of programming? Am I in the wrong class? No. Why? Why in the heck does it mention that? Do I have the wrong syllabus? All right, we need to make a few changes here. My mistake. See programming. Different class section, 2093. Notice it is a 2000 level course, meaning that, like I said, I expect that you've had programming prereqs and stuff like that. Class time, if you're here, you know when it is. Everybody's here. We're good. Alrighty, you do need a computer. I would uh, access to a computer. I mean, if you don't have access to a computer, you're going to probably want to wind up coming in on campus. I wouldn't try to do all this stuff with a Chromebook or an iPad. And I've had people try to do programming classes on on those two tools, and, or you know, Samsung tablet. Just doesn't really work well. We do have a text. Fortunately, it's real cheap compared to a lot of textbooks, right? I think it's in the 20s or third, something like that. Hope so. Um, if you want the second edition rather than the third edition so you can get it even cheaper, that's cool. But, right, you, you don't want to delay. You want to have the text um, pretty fast. So if you want to get an electronic version of it, that's great. The only thing you need to consider about getting the electronic version is I do allow you all to use your textbook during exams. But if uh, you have to miss an exam day and take it at the test testing center, they don't let you use Kindles or whatever. So you can't use a Kindle, you know, version for that. You'd have to have a physical textbook. All right, required software. We're going to use Visual Studio just because it's already installed on all these machines. But I want you all to have an introduction to doing, you know, things in a harder way. 
not everybody in the universe uses Visual Studio. You can be pretty sure that your PlayStation uh, programmers are not using Visual Studio. Um, C programming is, you know, considered a lower level programming. That doesn't mean lesser. It doesn't mean not as important. It just means that you're more in direct control of the hardware. And now C++ sits on top of C. And so pretty much anything you can do with C, you can also do in C++. But it's a particular set of skills. And there are compilers that compile C only. And we're going to be using something called SIGWIN, which gives you Unix tools on this, just so that we can compile from the command prompt, right? We can pop open a terminal, pretend that we are Linux gurus, and type stuff in, you know, and run programs directly there. S and then there is another one. If you've used NetBeans, we're going to use something similar called Eclipse. I'm hoping to use these to the exception of using Visual Studio. Why? Because Eclipse is cross-platform, right? You'll find it on Linux, you'll find it on Mac, you'll find it, you know, on Windows or whatever. So, it's a good tool to learn. Visual Studio is pretty much right only for Windows. It's not strictly true. They finally, after two decades, redid a version of Visual Studio for the Mac, but it doesn't really seem to be the same to me. You will need a C compiler. Installing the tools we use in class will probably be best. That doesn't mean you have to use it. You can just download any C compiler that, you know, and the textbook mentions another one. But, you know, if you get kind of stuck and something is working on the examples here and it's not working on your own, that's pretty unlikely. All right. We know when the first lecture is. We got a midterm coming up, end of June, after four weeks. We could also have a final. The uh, final, it's not like the final is comprehensive and a bigger super test. It's just like we have unit one and we have unit two. Right? That's how it's going to be broken up. And they just have the fancy names to determine final because that's a good way you know, to think about it uh, temporally. We have holiday. If you're going to withdraw, do so by that date or it winds up being on your uh, on your report card, and that's a pretty generous policy compared to a lot of other colleges. The last lecture is that Wednesday. We know when the final is. So you're going to have to be able to access D2L from home or whatever, wherever you're going, you know, wherever you're going to be doing your stuff. Your grading system, and I have this, I must have merged this with another, uh, with another syllabus completely because these uh, concepts are wrong. I, and I know I typed in the correct ones and I did not say, I'm having problems with Google Drive syncing. Okay, anyways, so grade scale is pretty uh, standard, right? 90 to 100 is an A, 80 to 89 is a B, 70 to 79 is a C. Now, in some weird circumstance where everybody was making a B and they didn't have A's, it curved things. But generally, people do pretty well in my classes. And I think that's because I'm an awesome teacher. No, I'm kidding. But, uh, you know, generally, people do pretty well in my classes. If uh, so, I never really have had to curve like that, pretty much. Not really planning on it. Um, grades are composed of three different things. You're going to have programming homework. You're going to have in-class assignments, which is when you type along with me during a tutorial. I could also just give you all in-class labs where I give you some printed instructions and I ask you to follow them rather than me come up here and type them. Probably not going to do that because this is a eight-week course and so time is at a premium and not only is it an eight-week course often an eight-week course is a class periods are twice as long and this one is not so we're gonna have to make sure that we use our time wisely if you add all this up it looks like you might be able to pass a course with a 70 even if you did hardly any programming homework but that's not true you have to do half your programming homework if I give you eight assignments you need to at least finish four of them right to pass that's just that's non-negotiable. So when you use D2L, I want you to give me the .c files, the .h files, the make files, whatever. Zipping up your folder is probably the easiest way to do that. At the beginning, you know, all we're going to have is a .c file, and that may be true for many, in which case you don't have to zip it. If you don't know what zipping means, it's pretty easy. You just go, you select the file you want to zip, you right-click on it, and do send to compressed folder. And if you're doing it on a Mac, you know, there's, it's very similar. Anyways, that'll make a zip file that you would then upload. 
but you only need to do that if you're uploading more than one file. Okay, so grading policy, if your program flat out doesn't run, then you're not going to get any credit for it. You'll get a 1%, but then you can revise it to try to get more credit. I'm a lot more forgiving of programs that don't run if you give me a comment as you're uploading it. There's a place where you can type in a comment. You know, if you say, you know, I just can't figure out why this is a syntax error, then I'm going to go, okay, yeah, you knew that it didn't work and, you know, whatever. But if you just upload it and then, then you know, it's a blatant surprise to me when I open it and I try to get it to run, flat out doesn't run, then, uh, you know, you're not going to get any credit for it. However, e pretty much, unless it's for cheating, anytime I give you partial credit for something, you're going to be able to revise it to get more credit, right? If your program only does three out of the six things I wanted it to do, you might only get half credit for it, then just revise it and re upload it. You know, the due date at that point doesn't matter as much, you know, because there's probably no way that you would have turned it in and me have graded it be all before the due date for you to turn it right. But, you know, just get your programs in by the due date and then if there's something else you need to do that I ask you to do, revise it and re-upload it. It's not your final answer. All right, apparently I uh, left in the syllabus that you're going to be getting the 5% grade bonus if you turn stuff in on time. I stopped doing that, but the syllabus has it in there. So guess what, guys? If you get your homework in by the deadlines, you get a little bit of a grade bonus, which is cool, right? All right, late assignments. 10% off per week, but if it's more than four weeks old, you don't get any credit for it. This is an eight-week class, right? So it'd be really... Anyways, I've had people wait until the very end of the semester to do all of their assignments, and yeah, some people are capable of doing that, you know. I would like for them to have spoken with me beforehand. Why? They weren't able to do the work beforehand. You know, uh, don't do that. Uh, just, just keep up with the class. Why? Because if you're keeping up with the homework, you understand it and you're absorbing more, right? If I did last week's assignment, I'm sitting here ready for this week's assignment. But if you didn't do last week's assignment, then this stuff is going to go over your head. If you are going to be late turning something in, but you tell me why. You know, Hey, I, I need to go down to Michigan for my, you know, my sister's funeral. Something grim like that. Sorry. You know, any, any reason, you know, just let me know. Talk to me about it and I might waive, you know, at least some of the uh, late penalty. Attendance, it's really important to be here. Why? Because we're only going to be here, you know, 16 class periods total. But I don't count off and all the uh, lectures are going to be videotaped. What happens when we videotape is just that you get the screen everything that's projected up here and you get my voice right you don't get to see my arms waving around and writing on the board and stuff like that but you can follow along with the lectures as a general the students who attend classes and do not miss many days perform better on the other hand some people do have to take things as online courses and you know and if you have the self-discipline to do that great if you're gonna ask for an incomplete if you know what an incomplete is an incomplete is when you know your instructor marks you with an I on your transcript with the assumption that you're going to then go in and complete the work and he'll fill in a, a real grade bed later. But if you don't complete the work, um, it's going to turn into an F. So I wouldn't. Yeah. Anyways, in order to do an incomplete, you already have to be passing the class. So you can't just not do the work and then, you know, the finals week say, I'd like to take an incomplete to finish the class. No, if you if you weren't keeping up with it all along, you can't get, get an incomplete. You could ask for it, but you're not going to be able to get it. All right, everybody here is already exempt from this one, or not exempt, but hopefully you know that if you skip the first week of class, it's really bad news. You'll be marked with an AW on your transcript. You'll be dropped from the class, and you'll be financially responsible for the class. It's better to just go and drop it, right? Because if you drop it soon, then you get, you know, you're not responsible for the. But if you get an AW, you are responsible for the cost. And if anybody gave you money to go take the course, then they're going to come and take it out of you. All righty. Yeah, there's some stuff here that I still need to remove. What are you responsible for? You have to have access to D2L. Please always check D2L. If you miss a class, you can check D2L, find out what we did that day. You can read the notes. You can see what new programming assignment kept up. Also, read and use the required text. Please keep up with the schedule. If you're falling behind, then it's going to be harder for you to understand the rest of the semester. 
you do need to complete your in-class and homework assignments. Do keep your stuff in. Com complete all quizzes and exams. Ask for help when needed. This is really important. I do type fast. Sometimes I go too fast when I'm going through my lectures. I talk fast. So ask for help. Slow me down, I swear. The people who ask me the most questions are the people, you know, I, I start to dig y'all. You know, we start bonding. And it's a cool thing. All right. You know, I don't care if you have your phones on your desk in front of you so that, you know, your, your, your wife or your kids or whatever can send you a text message or whatever, but don't be playing on your phone. Keep everything silent, right? You don't need to be, if you need to make a call, just step outside and, uh, you know, and make the call. And recently, in one of my classes last uh, spring, I had some what I consider really obnoxious behavior is I got some complaints towards the end of the semester that a couple of students have been sitting there and watching Twitch streams you know, through the whole semester and had been really distracting, but I didn't know that, right? They, they had it on silent or something like that. I don't know why they were watching it. Maybe they had earpieces and I didn't know. But it was distracting. It'd be, don't put anything on your screen that's going to distract the people behind you, right? And then I know some people are going to sit in the back. No, I'm kidding. Okay, just don't do that. All right. You do need to check D2L regularly. If I modify the syllabus, you will be told. I'll post about it. I'll email about it. And I'll mention it in class. I'll grade your homework within a week of submission. If there are errors, you can then turn around and revise it and resubmit. I try to answer email within 24 hours, but like I said, text texting, I respond much more quickly. What can you expect from me? Hopefully, I will provide clear instructions for the assignments. If you don't understand the instructions, ask me. You don't have to just brave it, right? You know, Go ahead and ask me to explain. If you don't understand it, it's likely that other people don't understand it, and you're doing a service for everybody. So answer questions regarding assignments. That's what I'm supposed to do, regardless of how you do it. If you ask something in email, then I may come and lecture on it anyways, right? You know, because I figured that other people need to know. I should grade things and give feedback. I will give you a week's notice of due assignments. I never say, okay, today's Monday and I want you to do this by Wednesday. I don't think that's cool. And I will post all assignments, notices, PowerPoints, and everything on D2L. All right, last one, in academic integrity. Don't cheat. How do you cheat in a course like this? Y'all could work together. No, you can't because that's cheating. You could turn in something that somebody else did. That's not cool. You could show somebody else your work. And that's the tricky one, right? You know, because I might be really stuck on something. And uh, I say, Susan, can you take a picture of your coat? Send it to me. I'm really just stuck. And Susan will probably go, I'll just mail it to you. And you go, ha, ha, ha. And you, and you upload what they mail you, right? and then it's an exact duplicate. Or even if you try to change it a little, right? You know, I've been doing this stuff for a long time. I can spot it when people are sharing their code with each other. And then you upload Susan's code without her knowledge. Susan is gonna make an F on that assignment and be very unhappy with you. And she could be very unhappy with me when I give her a zero on it. Don't take anybody else's work. Now, where it gets slightly fuzzy is when you're researching online, right? Because the internet is uh, your best friend as a programmer. I don't even know how people program before the internet, right? Um, so if you get stuck on something, you need to know how to do something. Yeah, okay, I want to learn how to print an array using C. Okay, cool. Well, dude, look at all these answers I've got here, right? Okay, great. Find one, read it, understand it, and then write your own code. If you copy and paste it, don't do that. If you copy and paste it and it doesn't look like stuff that we've done in class, I'm going to pretty much know that you didn't create it yourself, right? Because I'm going to I'm going to have been reading everything else you turned in and I'm going to know how I've been teaching you how to do stuff. You know, so make sure you just do your own code. Don't don't get your spouse who works at, you know, IBM or whatever to do it for you. Um, be real careful when you take code from online. You if you absolutely feel like you must take something from online and put it in there verbatim, just treat it like an English paper and give me a reference, right? I'll be much more forgiving if you do something like that than if you just turn in, you know, because say I ask you to calculate pi. Rather, you know, there there are formulas for calculating pi. Well, you Google calculate pi using C. All right, hey, cool, people have done it. Yeah, so you just copy this and you paste. No, you're not going to do that. You're going to follow the formula that I give you in your assignment. If what you upload doesn't look a thing like what I asked for, I'm going to know that you just went out and copied it. And bad things happen when you're uh, caught cheating. When I use that word because it's a strong word. Academic integrity is too soft, right? It's too politically correct. 
So what happens? You get a zero on that assignment. It gets reported down to the dean. It gets reported to the uh, the director of student conduct. So reports are filed all over the place. Why does that happen? Um, you know, used to be that every teacher would assume the best of the student. You know, and the students say, "I'm I'm really sorry. I, I just couldn't get it done in time." You know, and you know. I've been sick with the flu. I couldn't possibly do it. And you go, okay, I'll let it slide. But then they figured out that you know um, people, you know, contacting you know each other. That often what happens is that the same student will have a history of doing that in class after class after class, and that probably means that they're doing it in other classes that they're not getting caught on, right? And so now it all goes to one place. So the least that'll happen is you'll get an F for that assignment, and the worst that could happen is right, you could be kicked out of the college. You don't want to do that. So. Enough about that. Y'all, I'm sure that y'all are going to do your own work. If you get stuck on something, ask me for help. Those of y'all who have had me before, I hope you know, uh, would vouch, saying that I'll bend over backwards getting stuff to work with you. Free counseling, strongly recommend that if you're having troubles, you go and check them out. I know some of the people who work there, they're a really cool people. Student support services. If you have, you know, dyslexia or difficulties typing or something like that, if you need special needs, totally okay to go to these guys. You go to them, they'll help you fill out a form that tells, you know, what you need, what might they, what are some of the options. I need to sit on the front row. I need to be able to point a camera at you and record the lecture, right? You know, I need extra time on the exams. All that's fine. I'm happy to do it, but I need to know. So you got to go and talk to these people and they'll help you fill out the paperwork. There's something called the Student Success Center, but when I Googled it, it didn't look like they had any workshops this summer. But just keep this in mind. This is the kind of stuff that they have. Um, so here's their workshops that were for spring. So I guess they'll have some in the fall. Study methods, math anxiety, scholarships, tips on saving, growth mindset, mapping my plan to graduation. See, this is all pretty good stuff. Getting organized, resumes, dealing with debt, all good stuff. So, you know, there are resources available to you at Roche. You're not just doing it alone. And you're not just paying to come to classes. Yeah, that could be all that you're doing, but there's a whole, you know, infrastructure here dedicated to your success. All righty, electronic communication, you do have email. I hope everybody knows how to access your student email. Everybody was able to log in, right? Is there anybody who doesn't know how to get a hold of their student email? You can configure your phones or your tablets to pick it up, right? The student handbook, I have a link to it. It's well worth reading. You want to find out about what withdrawals mean or incomplete grades, how you audit something, what that means. You know what audit means to me? It means that somebody's going to ask to be switched to audit and then they're never going to show up to class again. Whatever. <laughs> if, if it makes you feel better to tell me that you're going to audit the course, you know, that you want to switch to audit, whatever. Alrighty, guys. So, what is C? C is a programming language that was like first published in 1970, which makes it one of the older languages that is still in use, and it is incredibly still in use. There are other languages which predate it that are in use, Fortran and COBOL and stuff like that, things that were invented in the 50s and in the 60s. But C became the template for a huge number of languages that followed it. C++, Java, JavaScript, um, just all sorts of languages picked up the C syntax that extended it. So why do we not teach just straight C anymore? Uh, three words, object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming is a paradigm that kicked in like in the 80s with the development of C++. It had already been around, but when it was molded on top of C++, object-oriented programming became the big thing, the thing that everybody thought that you needed to know. So, that's what you get taught. But underneath it all, there's still good old C. So what is C? C was designed to run computers, to write programs that would run computers. That was, that was its real purpose. And as such, if you know what assembler is, assembly code looks like this. Hey, that looked like a good example right over here. Let's see what this is. Yeah, that was a prettier picture on the other 
How come I didn't get that pretty picture? Anyways, like that. This is what assembler looks like. Would you want to have to type your code in like this? Nah, you really wouldn't want to. Each one of these corresponds to an operation that the chip can handle, right? I want to load something into my accumulator, and then I want to AND the contents of it, do a bitwise AND with another number, and then I want to jump to the instruction located at out, <laughs> output character, I don't know, right? And so, that is insanely difficult to read, right? That's what the uh, moon landers, right, in the 60s, NASA used, assembly, it was good enough for them. What did you do? You documented every single line so it was as absolutely clear as possible to read as, you know, as can be. Because and then you would have teams of people working on it all trying to validate that that it all worked correctly. And if you're curious, you can go, you know, NASA published the code for the moon landing, you know, computers. You can go and look. No, your watch, your you're like your even if you don't have an Apple watch or something, your microwave probably has bigger computers than the you know, better computers than the uh, than the lunar modules did. Yeah. So this kind of stuff you would use when you have an absolute minimum of space and memory for your program to run on. Nowadays, hardly anything has that absolute minimum of memory. But it is, you know, by far, you're, you're controlling the chip directly. You're putting numbers into it and you're calling op codes. And Well, C is one language above that, right? Except it replaces this stuff with programming structures loops and with variables and with algebraic math, right? You don't just have to and something, you know, and, uh, you know, give opcodes that control what are in the registers. You can say A is equal to B plus C. And then it's the responsibility of the compiler to go and to turn it into this stuff. Not that uh, we usually look at the output of the C compiler in terms of this. Usually we want our C compiler to then turn around and to turn it into an executable, a .exe, that you can actually run. So you don't really get to see this, unless you just really want to. You could, uh, you could see this stuff that the C compiler generates. But the C compiler takes it, turns it into object code, which is turned into .exe, uh, so that you can run it on your, on your computer. And it was designed to run on the computers that served as phone systems for switching systems by AT&T. But its syntax was so cool and it was bundled into Unix, which was just becoming a thing. Um, you know, AT&T made Unix and then all the co college campuses started using it. And so everybody got this cool programming language and so it, it just built up steam. It became, you know, a huge juggernaut. And then subsequently, you know, after the 80s, people started using C++ for the object-oriented stuff. But C still exists. Any compiler that can compile C++ can also pretty much compile C as well. So why would you want to program in C? Um, small code size. When you do C++, your C++ is like Godzilla, right? You know, and inside Godzilla there was a smaller loser that was just C. This is kind of stupid, right? But you know, you got C, you got Godzilla, you know, surrounding him. You, you don't necessarily need all that stuff. It's a much larger language in order to do object-oriented programming. And even if you've taken a C++ class here, we only scratch the surface of what C++ can do. You know, you know, there's, there's templates and, you know, classes and object libraries and all sorts of things that come with C++ that do not come with C. We mostly used C++ as a procedural language, right, where things just, you know, go in order. But if you've taken other classes like Java, you know, the advanced Java course, you know that uh, object-oriented programming can become kind of a convoluted thing. And if you take somebody who did procedural programming, you know, which is just statements that go, run, you know, from the top of the program to the bottom with a couple if statements and loops and stuff like that, it can blow their minds when they're trying to figure out a complex object-oriented programming system. You know, so that was the case with my wife. You know, she had done procedural programming. You know, made good money doing it, but then she had to take, you know, some object-oriented programming classes in order to modify some new software at her job. And it, it was a real culture shock. Where is the code that does this? Where is the code that does that? You know, you have all these classes defined, and it can be hard to figure out, you know, how 
to make them follow each other, uh, understand it. With C, since it is more linear, since it is, you're not writing classes, you can be fairly certain that you can understand it and it can be double checked and triple checked by other people more easily and you know exactly what the code is doing. When you're using C++ and you create a new object, you know, some memory is being allocated and you don't really know where that memory is coming from, how much was allocated, when that memory is going to be freed. You know, it holds your hand and hides a lot of that stuff. Why does it do that? So that you could write complex programs very quickly, right? That's the goal of these systems like Java and C++ and C Sharp. That's why they give you all these abilities. But if you need to control strictly how the memory is allocated, how you're talking to hardware and stuff like that, you want to know exactly what it is doing at every step in the program. And so, you know, Linux Torvalds, Linus, Linus, however you say his name, the guy who invented Linux, insists that the kernel be written in C rather than C++. And, you know, Linux is a huge project, right? And it's got gigabytes of code in it. Um, and it's all written in C. No, not the applications, like, you know, the user interfaces and stuff like that, the stuff that other people bolt on top of it. But he insists that all the kernel code be written in C because it's easier to debug, it's easier to read, you can get a couple people to look at it and they're gonna know exactly how it works. Even if it's complex code, you, you can know, okay, I'm, memory, I'm uh, ac allocating memory here, I know that I'm gonna release the memory here. I'm opening a file here, I know when that file is being closed. I'm not just depending upon some reference falling out of scope to automatically close my file like you can in other languages. Let's see if I had some other reasons for using C. Y'all are here, so you're already sold on the idea, but let's see. And I didn't take the pictures of what the, I was looking at. So code size, controlling the resources directly, understanding code without letting the complexity of object-oriented programming obscure it because yeah, object-oriented systems are great and stuff. And their object-oriented programming is designed to be extensible. Like if you're going to write code that's going to draw a menu on your screen and then you want to modify that menu so that one of the menus is actually something that you can type in a search word into and it'll highlight the other word, right? You know, the, the place, you know, in all the menus that'll do that. Well, with object-oriented programming, you should be able to inherit from the menu option and add your new functionality to it and stuff like that. You know, so inheritance is, is a really cool way of building extensible systems. But it can also lead to writing code that is difficult to follow. C++ doesn't give you that ability to write classes and inheritance. And uh, so you have to figure out other ways of doing things. All righty. Are there any questions so far? I know we've just kind of been babbling, but that's okay. I hope. Yes, sir. It's been about four years since I've taken a programming class. I'm a little fun to deal. I'm a deal. But you know what a loop is. You know what, what a variable is. You know what a variable yeah, is, is and stuff like that. But you know what a function is. You're yeah. gonna do good in the class. Yeah. Right. I mean that's basically all that I want you to know is you know, the idea of functions, the idea of variables, you know, what an if statement is. As long as we're at that level. Then, then we're going to go. I'm not be expecting y'all to be able to, you know, write a hash algorithm that'll do this or that, whatever. <laughs> you know, it's if, yeah. The book is called for absolute beginners. <laughs> if that gives you some comfort, great. If that makes you think, oh man, this is going to be a wasted class. Why don't I just get the book and read it over a period of two days? Well, we're going to be covering stuff that's not just strictly in the book, right? I'm going to be using other material as well. I have specific goals in mind of the stuff that we're doing, where we're going with this, and one of the reasons for this class is because if you take C++ here and then you go and you take a job elsewhere that is hoping that you'll know how to do things in a different way using underlying C, then people were lost. 
I don't know how to define these structures and to do all this, stuff, you know, this, that, and the other, allocate my own memory and things like that. So this is supposed to fill in that gap. It's just a little bit different than, uh, but the stuff that we have been doing in other programming classes, you know, or whatever, if statements, for loops, and all that knowledge still applies. Right. In fact, you know that that was the primary impetus for creating the language in the first place, so that you didn't have to write assembler, so that you could write if statements and for loops and stuff like that. So we will be covering that stuff. Any other questions? Got one from this side of the class. I'm gonna wait until one of y'all asks something. I'm kidding. Let's take a roll. I should know. Using the recording, I will be using some texts that other people have made. Specifically, if we go to online texts, we'll see something called Introduction to C Programming. And this, this actually looks like a really good set of PowerPoints. So, unfortunately, it didn't have a download button, so I couldn't uh, just grab the PDF for it. There's another one which I will be hitting, which is kind of amusing looking. What do I mean by that? Let me show you what this one looks like, the extensive guide to the C language. All right, the whole thing looks like this. <laughs> but we may dip into it. We may dip into this PowerPoint as well. And I downloaded a PDF of the textbook, which uh, you know I can't share with you all because you're supposed to actually buy it rather than just me hand out a PDF. You can get me fired for doing that. But uh, I'll just pull up the textbook at times and, you know, read a couple sentences from it and then go and expand on that. So with that in mind, let's go and take a look at our textbook. Please do go ahead and get it right and you know we will be giving some homework out especially by uh, you know Wednesday. I certainly will be giving you know programming assignments by Wednesday. So you're going to want to get the textbook fairly soon. But I don't expect y'all to have bought the book right now because some you know what if the teacher said, you don't need that text, we're using something else, you never know. It's a good idea to have the book. All right, the only problem with getting it as a PDF is it's for the prior edition, but it's just as good a version as anything else. All right, so what are we going to be covering out of this stuff? Some of these terms are going to be very simple. Keywords, the main function, directives, the GCC compiler. Well, y'all yeah, haven't called compilers directly from the command prompt before, most likely, in the languages that we've been teaching here. Primary data types, integers, floating points, characters. Notice that string is not a primary data type in this language, and there's no string class to make things simple. All right, conditions. Now, if statements, nested if statements, and stuff like that. Looping, the while loop, the do loop, the for loop. Hopefully, a lot, hearing a lot of this stuff should bring you comfort in that you already know it. If it doesn't bring you comfort, if you're going, oh, I don't really remember that, then that's okay because we are going to cover it, right? We're, I just don't want to spend the entire eight weeks and only get to, you know, chapter four or five, which is, uh, you know. Then, uh, you know, arrays. Arrays are really cool. Really something we need to hammer in on. Pointers. Pointers are incredibly important in this language. And they're something that a lot of the other languages you don't even have the ability to do. If, uh, you know, if you're used to doing Java programming, then pointers are something you just don't have access to at all. Strings. All righty. It talks about a string, but there's no string class unless something has changed. And since, uh, you know, the... 1999 version of C that I'm familiar with, but there you can use a character array to store strings of characters in, but that gives some you know complications, right? Not everything is is handed to you on a silver platter. You have to know how to manipulate that stuff. You need to know how to copy things from one you know one character array to another, things like that. Introduction to data structures. So this stuff. Introduction to data structures. Yeah, you probably know what a struct is if you've taken a Java class or something. A struct is a class without methods, essentially is how you could think about it. 
So we will have structs but no functions. And if that term, a class without methods, strikes fear into your heart, don't let it. It'll start to make sense. And dynamic memory allocation. This is stuff that we absolutely do not have to do in any of the other languages you've been using. And then file input and output and the C preprocessor. So chapters 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 are where, where the real meat are. And I'm really hoping that we can get to all that good stuff. That's, that's my goal is for us to be digging down here on the bottom rather than spend, like I said, the entire semester and only get to like the first five or six chapters. But be that as, as it may. I love this. This page intentionally left blank. That always cracks me up. I guess it's necessary to have because if I was looking at a PDF and it was blank, then you know, whatever. Alrighty. So, I will cover the following topics in this chapter. Installing and configuring the SIGWIN environment. We should be able to use SIGWIN here. I asked that, oh, maybe that's why we needed to be in the other room. We may not be able to sit in this comfortable room. We may be going back to 202 on Wednesday if I can't get SIGWIN installed over here. All right. But you can install SIGWIN on your machine at home. What is it? It gives you a whole bunch of Unix-based utilities that you can access via Unix shell on Windows. Now, it doesn't turn Windows into a Unix computer, but you know when you talk about Unix or Linux, if you're not just doing stuff using the user interface you know, and clicking Windows and stuff like that, if you're using the command line, you get used to being able to do things from the command line and being able to run the programs that are part of the new GNU library, GNU library, and then SIGWIN provides those for Windows as well. If you have a Mac, you don't necessarily need to do that because the Mac terminal is just a Unix terminal, pretty much, the bash shell. All right, so you're going to want to install SIGWIN. You're also going to want to install a C compiler, a just a straight C compiler. I'll give you a list of the things that I want you to tackle installing, and that'll actually be your first homework assignment is to figure out what kind of stuff you want to install on your computer. Easiest thing might be just to go and grab Visual Studio from Microsoft and download it and install it and say, okay, I'm done, right? But I'd like for y'all to also get SIGWIN and Eclipse, and we're going to be using that stuff in here as well. All right. So, our first program. Usually people put Hello World as the first program. This is just the exact same program, except uh, just a different funny text message there. Right. So what does this mean? Include standard io.h. Well, if you took C++, you didn't add .h. That was one way of differentiating C++ header files from C header files. C header files had .h. C++ header files at one time were called HPP, right? Just like CPP, C++, header file, plus plus. And then the uh, convention became to leave off the .h entirely. But We'll see dot H include. What this does is it brings us the ability to communicate standard I.O. What is standard I.O.? It's everything that goes to the terminal, to the command prompt, right? Reading input that the user types in on the keyboard and displaying output. So this one doesn't do any input, but it prints a message. See you later. Um, yes, sir. So like that header file, um, so like when the language was like just like created, there it wasn't really meant for input and output, or like was yeah, that, that just that was folded output? onto it, okay. right? So uh, you know, when it was created, it didn't need really. I mean, if it was purely controlling hardware, did you need to have the ability to type into it, right? No, it just ran, right? But very quickly you realize that you need the ability to display stuff. So yeah, uh, you know the header file will leak to code designed for your specific operating system or shell in order to do the input and the output. And then when you port the C language to a, another 
operating system, then different libraries will be used to display information in the read from the keyboard, but the C programming language should stay the same. So we're going to open up Visual Studio and start writing a program pretty quickly. That's going to make a lot more sense than just scrolling through the book. So go ahead and go to the Start menu. Do Visual, type in Visual here. Click on Visual Studio. If you install Visual Studio at home, like I kind of recommend, you're probably not going to get the 2013 version. You'll get a newer version of it. For some reason, we've never. Someday these machines will be updated past Windows 7. Of course, that would slow them down. And it's not like we have a lot of funds at the college. You know how uh, Oklahoma has been slashing education. So we may be using these Windows 7 machines for a few more years. So we are going to take advantage of the fact that the C++ spec sits on top of C. So we can just create a C++ file, but only put C commands in it, and then we're doing C programming. So when we're using Visual Studio, we have that option. So I'm going, now that I've got it up and running, I hope everybody else does, let me know if I'm going too fast, because I know that the software the first time it runs can take a while get going. New project. Visual C++. Empty project. I'm going to just call this one first code. Or I'm going to call it, I'm going to give it the really clever name of June 4. So I chose empty project, I chose June 4. Take a good look at where it's saving its projects. If you want to, you can browse and pick another directory. Right? So I could click browse, go to my desktop, make a new folder and call it C projects. You don't have to do that, you, but when you upload something, you're going to have to know where that file was. And then select that. Select the folder, and we're good to go. Now it's going to create it. No. There. I do strongly recommend that you bring a flash drive and back up all your work on it. Why? Because uh, if the computer's yanked out, you know, from underneath you because it, it broke, and that happens regularly with these computers, it'll get swapped out, and then you won't have any access to right to your files that you saved on it. And you click OK. All right, now we don't have any source files here. If we had chosen one of the other options, then uh, Visual Studio would have gone ahead and, and fleshed it out with some boilerplate code, but we don't want any boilerplate code. So we're going to add a new item. And instead of calling it source.cpp, let's just call it source.c. Or maybe even call it, just like we did our, our project name, june4.c. All right, so over here is our Solution Explorer, which has got you know all the information about that project. What I want us to do is to get away from using Solution Explorers and these cute little IDEs and to be able to compile this stuff by hand and to create our own make files, you know, and run compilers against that. But you know, in the interest of uh, you know getting things off at a, at a running pace, we are going to take advantage, you know, of the niceties that modern development environments give us. All righty. Okay. 
and saving it in local admin. I don't know why I chose that ridiculous path. So browse and create a different folder somewhere on the desktop or in the documents directory. Just call it C projects or something like that. That do the folder. And if anybody else had the same problem, if it's just not linked into the A the file. What you're going to do is you're going to right click on source files, if you haven't already. Do add, new item. Choose C++ file, but when you name your file, just give it the file name of .c. I called mine June4.c. Click add. And when you do that, you'll see the June4.c file over here. Well, let's just be silly and type this. Int main parentheses in parentheses return zero. That's like the most absurd program possible. Doesn't do anything. Then choose rebuild from the build menu. All right. Said it succeeded. We compiled something. Doesn't do anything. If we run it, great. Right? It just flashes something and goes away but it did do something. We're going to expand upon that now. Firstly, we're going to just write our usual hello world. So pound sign include, and what is a command that begins with a hash sign called in this language? It's called a preprocessor directive. Include angle brace std io dot h and that's enough that's something specific I wanted to show and I'm not sure I'm remembering how to do it all right then type outs like that with a semicolon outs parentheses in parentheses but inside the semicolon, let's put something. And then do another one. Out S into parentheses, or beginning parentheses, goodbye. And just so that we can see our output, we're going to call pause. Now when you're writing things to run via SIGWIN or Eclipse, you're not going to do that. This is making a Windows specific call to the uh, Windows operating system to just cause it to, uh, to hang out there so that we can see what happens. Now we could configure this in such a fashion. You know what? I don't want to be lame. Get rid of that system pause. Delete that line and we're going to run it not in the debugger. Instead, we're going to come up here and then do debug start without debugging. That lets us not have that system pause there. So what did I do? I went to debug start without debugging. The project is out of date. Would you like to build it? Yeah, sure. There are build errors. What did I do wrong? Outs is undefined. Okay, fine. Change those outs to print F.
and I'm probably going to have to put the pause command back in because even when I run it without debugging, it's uh, closing a window. So, our last line of code system, parentheses, begin quote, pause. Where's that pause come from? Um, if you launch the Windows command prompt, what people call DOS sometimes, there is a command in it called pause, right? Not pays. And all it just does is display the message. Press any key to continue. So since this is doing console input output, we can take advantage of that. So build, rebuild project, run it, and it says hello and goodbye. Now I'll tell you what out s was supposed to do, but since it didn't get linked in, I'm probably just going to ignore it. Notice that when I ran it, it put it all in one line, right? It didn't go to the next line. Right, hello, goodbye. So how do I fix that? We use escape sequences. Slash n. What means go to the next line. So after the word hello, but before the end quote, I'm going to put a slash in. After the word goodbye, I'm going to put slash in. I'm not going to put it in pause because this is a call to the operating system. We don't need to be adding escape characters into it. All right, now our output looks a lot better. Hello and goodbye. So, thing one to note is that in all of our other languages, we had commands which would uh, skip automatically to the next line, right? And you could in in these languages. No, that's not true. C out didn't automatically go to the next line. You had to use E and D L. But in Java, you had print line, right? In uh, Python, you had print. Both of those went to the next line. But in Java, you also had just plain, not print line, write line. You also just had plain write, which would uh, not go to the next line. Here, if we want to go to the next line, we have to call it specifically slash n. Right? That, what an escape sequence is, is it's a character that is not part of the rest of the sequence. It means skip out of this mode. We're no longer t using typewriter characters there. This is a special thing. This is a carriage, this is an ASCII code of 0D what it gets turned into. And if we looked up at the ASCII chart, it would say that that was a new line or, or a line feed character. So there are other escape sequences besides slash in. All right, so I know that some people needed to boot Windows and get it running, so let me pause and make sure that y'all caught up. How would you, uh... Just to make this look weird, to make it look different, because we could have done this if we took our C++ class. We haven't learned anything new except that we have a different print command now, right? Instead, we're going to do something that is kind of annoying. Let's do this. Character A, comma B, comma C, comma D. And we're going to say A is equal to single quote W, B is equal to single quote little lowercase o, C is equal to single quote lowercase w, and now we're going to print that out. Oh wait, we had a D, we may as well put our D there as well. D is equal to single quote backslash the one above the inner key N. Maybe you see where we're going with this. Print F. And have four percent C's in here. Like this. Percent C, percent C, percent C, percent C. End quote, comma, A, comma, B, comma, C, comma, D.
Should have been printf. Thank you very much. I don't know why I left that off. All right. If I have not made a mistake, then when this runs, it should print out the word wow after our hello and after our goodbye. Yep, hello, goodbye, wow. What's going on here? We are defining four ASCII characters. And we are printing them out one by one. We're going to get even weirder. We're going to go look up the ASCII value for W. So I'm going to pop open good old Google. I'm going to type in ASCII chart. I'm going to find out that a W, maybe an uppercase W, is the ASCII value 87. So I'm going to go back over here and instead of A is equal to quote W quote, I'm going to make that equal to 87. I'm going to find out what an O is. A lowercase O, according to our ASCII chart, is 111. So I'm going to delete that. And then a lowercase w, I'm going to delete that quote w, according to the ASCII chart, is 119. A little mental trick that you don't have to memorize, but if you have a, the ASCII value for an uppercase letter, if you want to turn it into a lowercase letter, you just add 32 to it. So this was an uppercase W, that's a lowercase W, so I took 32 and added it to 87. But I didn't, instead I looked it up on the chart. Alrighty, so hello, goodbye, wow. What are we seeing here? We are seeing the conversion of ASCII bytes into characters when they are being displayed to the screen. So what is ASCII? You know, letters have to be stored somehow in your computer, right? Uh, and so they have to be turned into bits, a series of zeros and ones, so that they can be stored in your computer's RAM or on the hard drive. And you have to have some standard. And it wasn't until the 60s that, uh, you know, people came up with a standard that was used everywhere. And even then, it wasn't used absolutely everywhere. Of course, IBM had to have their own standard that was incompatible with ASCII. Yeah. So, and then if you were using a language other than English, right, this doesn't have other letters in it, right? It doesn't have umlaut O's and, you know, and tarot bangs and upside down question marks and all the other things that you might need, you know, in foreign languages. This is very specifically, you know, American and Britain English, right? But anyways, so if you were going to store the word wow in your computer's memory, there would be a s series of values out in RAM. I just looked them up. Why don't I look at the source code? 87, 111, 119, and then whatever slash n is, which we could go and look up as well. Let's do that before we go on further. Where is our slash n? Where is the line feed? Carriage return. Let's type that in. Let's make it equal to 13. Okay, so we've replaced all of our values with their byte equivalents there. If you don't know what a byte is, you know, this is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm throwing words at y'all, and usually I'll go back and I'll loop and I'll explain a little bit, but just for now, take it on faith that a byte is a small number between 0 and 255. Pardon me? That got rid of Okay, I want to see that. I want to see what it does. Maybe it should have been a... A zero A. When I put it in, I put it in. Uh, uh, I put it in single quotes and it did right. Oh, I. No wait, what was in single quotes? Oh, actually, never mind. Okay. Change this to a ten. Let's see if that works. If this doesn't work, I'm not going to spend any further time on it. Right, we're going to just change it back to a backslash in. Okay, so my mistake. 0D stands for carriage return, which sent it back to the beginning of the line. Here's what actually happened. When I had it as 13, what it did is it printed out a W, it printed out an O, it printed out another W, 
and then it printed out the 13, which is the character term. But like when you hit the uh, enter key on a typewriter, it not only sends the thing back to the beginning, but it scrolls up a line. Printing out a 10 just sent it back to the beginning of the line, but it didn't scroll it up a line. And then when the message for the pause overwrote everything that we did. So it needs to be 10. That's a character term. I'm going to put some comments here. What is this? This is a capital W. This is a lowercase w. I need to watch our time carefully. This is, whoop, no, that's a lowercase o. That's a lowercase w. And this is a character term. No, it's not. It's a line feed. OK. Everybody got this working. I was talking about ASCII. You keep seeing me go back to that chart. What it is, is it's a lookup table showing what a typewriter key, like a capital W is, is stored internally on your hard drive or in your computer's RAM. It's stored as the number 87. And so out in RAM, if we had the word wow, we would see an 87 followed by a 111, followed by a 119, followed by a 10, except it would be all zeros and ones, right? It would not be saved as that. And if you want to type in ASCII values directly into your computer, if you're using Windows, it doesn't work on a Mac, you can type in Alt and then type in numbers that you want and then release the Alt key. So like that capital W was a W, I'm going to hold the Alt. Keeping it down, I'm going to type in 87 and I'm going to let up. I'm going to hold the Alt key down and type in 111 and let up. 119, let up. 10, let up. Okay, that, that one kind of didn't do exactly what I was expecting, but all right. Okay, so we're going to make a Dropbox for you to upload this file. What I'm going to ask you all to do is your homework assignment. Install a C compiler. I will post a link to download Visual Studio from Microsoft, but that is not the only C compiler. You could follow the book's advice and install SIGWIN. So go ahead, install a C compiler, and then write a Hello World program and run it. Add a system pause at the end. to tell, you know, Visual Studio to keep the window open. If you're not using Visual Studio, you can leave that off. And you don't have to type in all this stuff whenever I'm creating a homework assignment. Right, I'm going to upload that and put it in the instructions for the Dropbox. So, what I would like for you to do is to install Visual Studio by next Monday, have written a .c program, proven that it works, take a screenshot, upload the screenshot. If you don't know how to create a screenshot and you're using Windows, it's pretty easy. Go ahead and do that, guys, for this. Just hit the print screen button, which is way up in the uh, corner above your numeric keypad. Hit that and then launch paint or another editing program so go to your run box and type paint and then paste how do you paste when you don't have these little menus well you have your paste right here then you could save that you don't have to do that today and I'll include it in the instructions but I just want you all to have the idea click the print screen button open up paint or you know paint.net whatever your favorite painting program is paste it in there save it and upload that to prove that you ran it. Now, 
What if you aren't going to do this stuff at home because your computer doesn't support it? Well, instead you're going to write a note saying I'm going to do all my homework at school, but thanks for asking. You know, but I'd, I hope that's not the case. I hope everybody has a computer to do this stuff at home. You're going to be far happier that way. All right, so that's your homework for Monday. There will be another assignment on Wednesday, of course, so that you have more interesting stuff to work on over the weekend than just doing that. If you've already installed Visual Studio from your prior classes, great. If you want to get adventurous, eventually what I'm going to ask you to do is to install SigWin and Eclipse. So if you've already got Visual Studio up and running, instead install SigWin and Eclipse. Right? Just because that's one of the things we're going to be using in class and that'll give you something to do other than just write me a note saying I've already got Visual Studio Joker, ha ha ha. Okay, let's make a Dropbox so you can upload your CPP file. And get your book and read chapter one, right? Reading assignment. So I always do record the video lectures unless something catastrophic happens, like the computer crashes, right, while it's saving it. So if you are not there for class, what you're going to do is you're going to look at the date, June 4, and then you're going to go to content, video, and find the <coughs> link to the YouTube video for June 4. And then just watch it, and you can follow along. All righty. So how do you find your program? Well, if you memorize that path, that's great. Otherwise, you can come up here to Solution right click on it and do open in file explorer once you do that you can go into your source directory apparently I, and find your C file where it says C source hopefully you have file extensions enabled so that you can see all this stuff if you don't have file extensions enabled you go to folder search options but it's in a different place on everybody's computer so I'm not going to spend a lot of time but you go to folder options view and you can enable file extensions so that you see the .c file so you pick the file you upload it you submit it be sure you click submit or else the uh, it's like adding an attachment and not clicking this, the send button on email. It doesn't actually go anywhere. All right, gang. Hope nobody's scared off. Hope y'all stay in it. And I got students hoping that I'll go to the next class for C++. If you've never taken C++ and you want to learn it at the same time you're learning C, just to mess with your brain, enroll in it, and I teach it directly after this class.